This is a quote. Um, this is actually a quote from uh, Bruce Schreier. And it basically is, if you think, for example, technology can solve your security problems, well, actually, you don't have an idea or you don't understand the technology itself. And if you don't know who Bruce is, he's a very famous cryptographer, right? And the, the, the thesis here is, are we being naive? Do we, do we kind of depend or have this sort of pseudo dependency on technology? And are we naive comes from a person with whom I work in Swiss cybersecurity days in Switzerland. And his uh, name is Nicholas uh, Mayencourt. And Nick actually is the CEO of Dream, Dream Labs Net. And he has a group of ethical hackers, which are interesting people. For example, there's one lady named um, Bertha, uh, Shayla Bertha Yen, who's from Argentina, and she likes to hack cars, or she hacks. And the reason, I asked her, why do you do that? And her uh, response was, because I can. Because I simply can. And so this is the kind of thing that we have to think about. Let me just say that you're going to hear and weave things today from me. I'm not going to talk about technology in the weeds. I'm going to talk as, as you would expect from a keynote and some observations I have, particularly from the other side of the world, too. So some of the three, I always do things in three because people remember three. But you know, cloud security is, or security overall is everyone's responsibility, not just a CISO. It's everyone's responsibility. Emerging technologies, we need to think of them as tools. And they're emerging, you know. And note extremely well that AI, you know, strategy is happening within countries. And I'm going to provide some examples. So we live, I'm a dual citizen, so US, Swiss. You know, you have to think about what is the United States strategy for artificial intelligence. There are discussions happening today about this. And the reason being, you will see soon, is because it's going to be very, very important. There is this intersectionality which the two previous uh, speakers have uh, actually pointed out between this notion of AI and, um, and security. So, the agenda, I want to talk a little about the, the situation. Situation you're going to hear commonly, some of the challenges that we have or that we're faced with here. Uh, emerging technologies and some recommendations overall. And challenges, I like to think of them as opportunities. As opportunities. So the situation, this is the tip of the iceberg. I could have come up with more and more and more and recent, more recent, more recent, more recent, more recent examples of this. But you have so many organizations, so many uh, examples of, uh, and this is a chat GPT example, so where uh, you have you know, public disclosure, there's some data that's been uh, leaked, data leakage is a, a problem, and um, I will say this, uh, as somebody who has been a victim of that, uh, it, is a, it is very sensitive. And by the way, so these are some of the tips of the icebergs of, of, of examples that we see. And or you have examples like this one. How long has it been there since you figured it out? Right? That's scary. That is hugely scary. And so, um, you know, uh, again, several, several examples. And one example that I will, I like to make personal stories here. This is not necessarily about hacking per se. There are hacks, that there are people who are very, very miscreant in our world. And by the way, my argument is that the earliest adopters of these technologies are the very people you're trying to protect yourselves from. Okay, and I'll give you an example too of that. So in February of 2018 uh, was the largest leak of data in Switzerland by a company that's incumbent Swisscom. Now, that wasn't a hack. It was how data was actually handed off to a third party provider. Now, this is important. It's tangentially related to, to the topics that we all care about. 
And I was one of those VIP customers, which meant I paid more. But my data was leaked. And it wasn't enough that the CEO of that company said, well, gee, my data was leaked also. It wasn't enough. It was because it fell into wrong hands. Now, what did I see? Robocalls. You know, robocalls. And that's problematic, too. So responsible data, and especially if you're in Europe, it's going to be responsible data is extremely important. And when we talk about these emerging technologies, I will argue privacy is going to be very, very key here. Very key. Don't forget that. The other thing is, in Swiss cybersecurity days, just to give you kind of a handle here, you know, you look at some of the issues that people care about, uh, especially CEOs and CXOs uh, and so on. When something happens, guess where it goes up to? It goes up to the CEO, it goes up to the chairperson at the board, it goes up and up and up. And so the CISO, I will argue, needs help. Right? It's everybody's responsibility, everybody's responsibility. So in Swiss cybersecurity days, about 2019, we had, because I built you up, I'm going to build you up an a narrative around nation states. We had a person that had to come under a bodyguard uh, because this person was hacking into North Korea, which was quite interesting. And uh, we had embassies there, we had military attaches there, we had all kinds of people. And um, what we had insights into is what North Korea wanted to do, right? And um, why they're extremely interested. Look at today, who are they meeting with and trying to get more and more technology know-how, right, in this particular space. But it was, uh, what w was quite intriguing, that w what we saw there. And so with the military, in Switzerland, they're trying to build a cyber command, what you have like a cyber command maybe in Maryland or in the United States, and recruit a lot of people there because that's where they see the battle, for example. And so this is what I see as a tip of this di uh, uh, iceberg. And the thesis here, or their observation, is that it's getting worse and more complex. Worse more complex, very interesting, and you know, it's quo about is how can we protect ourselves? And so these are our challenges, fundamentally our challenges that we see. That figure this, um, I worked 17 years at a company called Cisco, so Cisco Tech, and I was actually quite, quite involved with Cisco. So there were, you know, if you think about 100 uh, zettabytes of data stored in the cloud by the end of 2035, that's 100 billion terabytes. So think of what that means when we're talking about things you have to care about, cloud, you have to care about security. And so, you know, 83% of, of folks are really looking at um, trying to understand what the security postures and implications are, offense, defense. Wonderful discussions that I had the opportunities to sit in yesterday. Attacks are more frequent. In fact, ransomware is more frequent, quite frequent. Um, and so we have an example in, in Germany where there was an example of ransomware and a person did die just didn't pay. Right? Those are the kinds of things that you're dealing with, and no one is immune. And that has implications to the sh shortage of security expertise, right? Um, and security expertise is, which is what I mean, it's everybody's kind of responsibility is to seek what we call seek to understand what that means. And in Europe, as in most parts of the world, there is a shortage of this talent, and they're looking all kinds of ways to have this talent. So people, you don't have to have, you know, sort of a degree in, in computer science. 
Some people come from excep exceptionally eclectic backgrounds and they do exceptionally eclectic work in this space. And he's nodding, right? Right. So this is important and one of my, one of my uh, sponsors here is from uh, City University of Seattle. Never have I envisaged myself when I was a graduate that I was gonna do this. You just kind of happenstance land in it. So everybody has this opportunity. Now, can we keep up? This is an argument, can we keep up? Heck, you know, it's, it's the next step and it's next step. You know, uh, as I said before, people are, um, the very early adopters of this technologies are the folks you're trying to protect yourselves from. In the same conference that we had, we had an example of what it's like to go into this under crazy world market space of where people do nasty things, where you're working with Europol, Interpol, and all kinds of police and agencies. My argument is um, not to, I think the question is not can you keep up, it's more or less you know, being able to be aware. It's just, in, it's an awareness than anything else. There's gonna be newer and newer and newer and newer and newer technologies that are gonna come across this way. And um, as I stated before, it's everybody's um, responsibility, but it doesn't necessarily have to land always in the CISO's lap. The CISO needs help. So this gets me into some of the examples that we're gonna talk about a little bit that have been topics of this conference for the past day and a half. Generative AI, blockchain, by the way, it's past that chasm already. Quantum X, quantum computing, do you speak qubits? All right, um, and by the way, uh, the nation state race that we have to care about. So in the generative AI, now we just heard kind of the discussions here, um, you know, has this ability to, we, we can imagine you're, 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 it's consuming a lot of data sets. And it has this ability to respond and mitigate against all kinds of real time to, uh, um, and kind of form real time attack postures in machine learning. There is this autom autom uh, automation of security uh, tasks that's inherently in this discussion and, you know, um, an attack and creating attack simulations. However, the thing of it is, is that it's consuming a lot of, lot of data sets. And there's a flip side of what can be, what can go wrong. And before I go to that flip side, I had the opportunity to speak with somebody who is the AI, person responsible for AI, and to some extent security at a very famous automobile age, um, company in Germany. You can figure out, you got choices, who that, which that could be actually. And we had a long discussion. He came to me and he said, you know, I'm really concerned about artificial intelligence overall. We weren't even talking about generative AI. You know, basically what he was, because you're thinking, looking at the constant, you know, consumption of all of these data sets, he would put in, it's learning from, from conversations that are out there in the industry, that are out there, that are available, that are out there. So if you were to put in, which he showed me, woman, what he got was prostitute and housewife. Seriously, prostitute and housewife. And so he said, it's not, it's not the algorithm, it's what it's learning, it's what it's learning, what's learning, uh, these conversations. And it's tendentially related, but you're gonna have some elections pretty soon, and that's gonna be interesting, right, in this space. So generative AI is one flip side of this, but it's to be aware, you can have data poisoning and model, model bias. That's something that we have to be aware of, right? There could be unintended disclosures of, of your sensitive data. Recall what I said earlier that data, you know, privacy is very, very important. And so one of the things that I would argue is that you have to do a little more research here. That's kind of what we see. We see the opportunities, they're kind of interesting. I was actually on a panel of generative AI in business 
uh, in, uh, with some, uh, some folks, NVIDIA and other companies, and um, they're saying, we're using it now. Uh, you know, this is our, what we want to do. This is going to help us in the infrastructure space, particularly with NVIDIA, and um, we think it's going to be much more interesting. Yes, but, you know, there's always a flip side of it, and so it's uh, my posture here is, you know, always to be aware. So with regard to blockchain, um, actually this is an interesting space because it's a space I actually am from. In fact, I like to understand what I don't know I don't know. So I went off and got a degree, master's degree in um, science, uh, computer science, basically on digital currency and, and blockchain. It's quite interesting. I'm a graduate of 2019, but got that, which was interesting in itself. But it is a distributed ledger. Um, there is going to be, you know, you see that as a distributed ledger in computers. Um, it is encrypted. There's a decentralized ledger. It doesn't solve world hunger for sure. It does not. But there are uses, and people are looking at these uses today. Um, so instead of storing, as we see, all the data and transactions, they go into a cloud and they solve a puzzle and so on and so forth. Though my degree was a nice little paper degree that I got from the credentialing university, in the event that that credentialing university would go out, I'm also, I have it also stored in referenceable in blockchain. So the question is, would you hire me if I were to show you that? That has all references to the future of work. And here's the thing, there is research going on uh, right now to be aware of. Some publications that are coming up perhaps in IEEE, looking at the interoperability between these distributed ledger types. Uh, we're not talking about crypto here. And so education, so there is some cloud. That intersectionality between blockchain and cloud security research is in progress. So something to, to be cognizant of. Do you speak quantum? Qubits? So post-quantum cryptography, we've got all kinds of things that we have to care about in quantum. And it's not about a faster, better uh, machine. It's about efficiencies here. It's about cryptography. In fact, um, I had the chance to meet a 17-year-old girl who cares about quantum deeply. She's a speaker. She's, she's from Chile. Um, she spoke at the ITU, and this is her space. She's got it internationally. She loves quantum computing. She wants to understand it more. But here you're talking about interesting things that are going on, the quantum internet. Is it way off in the future or not? Do you talk about quantum, uh, safe quantum, for example? So um, I had a chance last year to contribute to a um, GSMA because I'm you know, coming from a, a telecommunications background for mobile computing, where with, together with IBM and uh, a few other folks, Vodafone and BT Research and all of the research or organizations, Verizon and so on, and looking at what it means to have a quantum safe infrastructure. That is available for public, uh, public you know, reference. But people care about it, and here's why we need to care about it, especially in your business. And that is because there will be so much power in this, in this area that, you know, NIST has actually predicted that you can crack 2048 cryptography. Um, and they're looking at breaches to occur as early as 2030. As early as 2030, soon upon us sooner than you think upon us. And so this kind of sets up a little bit of the space that I'm looking at uh, with folks in terms of, you know, what does it mean for our future when we're talking about nation states? So this is kind of a, a notion here, but we're also looking at, you know, there's, there's something that's tendentially related, and that is, you know, faster compute, Big computers, computers that are going to be the fastest in the world, that race is going on and on, which is the fastest, fastest, not directly related here, but tendentially related. So you can see 
we're going to be busy. See, those are busy. <laughs> it's a busy space for us. It's a great opportunity, too. So busy space, great opportunity. Nation states. I'm going to give you two examples of nation states, although each country, whether you're Israel, whether you're, uh, you know, whether you're uh, Japan or wherever, are going to have some kind of AI posture. This is going to get us into AI and nation states. So the Chinese government fundamentally is really investing heavily in this. They've made no secret about it. And in fact, um, they're creating, they put in about 200 billion US dollars worth of, of you know, money that would make it a world leader by 2030. And greatly protective of their IPR. Greatly protected of their IPR. So this is no secret about it. It's also in their five-year plan. You know, they, you can read it in English. I lived in Hong Kong, by the way, so just as an FYI. But this is important for China. So this is their strategy. Let me flip it to this country. So the Russian Federation, um, interestingly enough, they care deeply about it. Actually, there was an insecure access to, um, interesting, I kind of uh, played a little bit of exper experiment to um, Putin's site, but they care deeply ab uh, about it, okay? And their goals are very clear. Fundamentally, they're actually, they have 65 AI projects going on. They're talking about AI sovereignty. He cares about this sovereignty. He calls it technology sovereignty. And has tasked his, research, his technology arm to go further into this space. And you can see him the most recently, I think it was, I have some notes here, it was September 7th in the Moscow Times. They actually published the latest here, which is what he cares about. AI is important to the Russian Federation as it is important to, the, to China. And so this is kind of key because it gets us to what we have previously talked about is our, our postures here in terms of technology and where we want to go. Because there is this kind of race that's, that's occurring as, as we speak. And interestingly, when I lived in Hong Kong, I had a chance to go and speak at a university in Shanghai, Shandong University, two years ago. Actually, I had to have a clean laptop when I did it. I mean, coming back was just so infected. But not too far where I spoke was, this, was, the, was the People's Republic Army of their cyber command, of their cyber command, which is quite interesting. I did not know that. Now I know now. So emerging technologies are something that we have to be aware of. They are really coming into space for us and into play for us. We have to focus on this interse intersectionality, AI. This is great that we're doing it here at the Cloud Security Conference. I am so excited about that. Um, with cloud security. It's a technological arms race. It's what I told you, what I've seen before. People are putting much more money in this space. Um, and by the way, you know, you have to think about that weaponization. There's, there's, there's pros and cons, benefits and everything, but the weaponization is what is of deeply concern and we can see the potential for that. And the simple thesis here is that we really, the simple, recommendation is that we all, all, all must be alert. So, back to three again. Remember those three. Understand the implications of all of these new technologies to your organizations. Please, please, please do. It's a lot of research. Research before you do. Go. It's a lot going on, but there's great opportunities. And education, life gone. Go for it. Research always, and it's everyone's responsibility um, as, we, as we can really well imagine. And without further ado,
I'm going to leave about a few minutes for Q&A. Thank you very much.